Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we are going to remodel the Skulk Farm based around the zombie spawner that we did in the last episode. In fact, I've already done a little bit of that as you saw from the time lapse that we opened this episode with. I have torn out the majority of the redstone circuitry and all of the stuff that was producing the stone here and I've reset all of the area up here with a water tray that's going to channel the zombies into a water stream, a water bubble column that's actually going to take them upwards and then drop them down from a greater height. Because the problem we ran into in the last episode is not really something that I can do anything about. The fact that this spawner ended up not being high up enough to allow the zombies to simply die of fall damage, which is the most effective way of killing pretty much every zombie that's going to fall down here. Channeling them into a water stream will also allow us to do a couple of other things, namely install some lava that's going to get rid of the chicken jockeys and also soften the mobs up so they're guaranteed to take fall damage even if they are wearing armor. That was something that we couldn't really do a whole lot about with the powdered snow setup that we had there before. This setup should also take care of any of the baby zombies and basically has contingency plans for every single type of zombie, which I did didn't really factor into our initial design here. In fact, one of the first things I'm going to do is head back over here and grab some soul sand. I don't think I've got any here with me, so I think we will need to briefly head back to the nether, but I'm pretty sure there's a soul sand valley really close by so we can get some soul sand for the bubble elevator. Yep, just over this way we've got a soul sand valley. Just a couple of soul sand blocks should do fine. We're only going to need one, but I think we'll probably grab a couple of extra just in case we lose them. And the portal to the ancient city is actually still over here in the Salt Delta and frankly I've just memorized the route over here it's just kind of around this corner and the portal is right there and it's so secluded that I haven't had to worry too much about magma cubes or gusts or anything like that so I just pop myself through this portal when I need to. Anyway, back over here, we can do a quick refresher on how we're going to get these zombies to step into a bubble column, because this is one of the most crucial parts of this whole setup, and it's really useful if you want to set up a full trap for these two high mobs like zombies and skeletons. We've got the water tray set up so that the zombies will filter out into here and another water stream there is going to carry them along a few blocks. Once that's happened we're going to set up a slab here and we're going to have a wall right there underneath the level of this bottom half slab right there. Behind that we're going to place our soul sand block level with the block that that slab is placed on and crucially we need to make sure that once we design the pipe for the zombies to fly up we're going to need to leave one block missing here right there so that's where the water is going to flow inwards and we need to make sure that there is a gap basically pulling the zombies towards that. The flowing water from this lowest water source block is going to flow backwards and that's going to carry the zombies a little bit further into this water stream which is going to allow them to shoot up once the bubble column hits them. Naturally we're going to make sure all of this is walled off so that no water or zombies can escape. We're going to place a water bucket on that slab there and that's going to flow in towards the wall and then we'll place another water bucket there and that's going to flow down over onto the slab but no further than that and that's going to make sure that once the zombies end up coming down down here, they end up on top of the slab, the slab's going to push them over the wall, the wall will keep them at that one and a half block height, and then you can see they get a quick bump up onto the soul sand. At this point we're going to break down some birch into a couple of signs, we want to have signs there and there to make sure that the water cannot escape from this, but it's still a too high space that the zombies can enter, and now we can start filling this whole area up with water that's going to form a water bubble column here. And from this point we're going to go up 30 blocks, we want to have the zombies drop from a pretty decent height, they're going to be dropping onto something that's around the level of this floor here but probably a couple of blocks higher because we'll need to put in the stone generator like we had before and while a fall of 24 blocks should be enough to kill a zombie outright any zombies that spawn wearing armor are going to absorb some of that damage and they'll naturally need to take a little bit more damage for them to be killed on impact some zombies might even spawn with even more armor than that and manage to survive the fall or if there's their armor is enchanted with protection or feather falling or something like that but that's where the lava comes in is hopefully going to deal a little bit more damage before they fall down. So we're going to put all of that stuff in in just a second. But first of all, I'm going to count out 30 blocks. We've already placed two, so I'll put 28 in my hotbar and we're going to go straight upwards. 
Once that water pipe is all built, we need to come back up here and grab some ice because the ice is going to be an easy way of making water sources all the way up there without having to bring up multiple buckets with us. We're going to pillar up placing ice all the way and as you can see I've also included a bit of tinted glass in here so that we can see the zombies going up this column here without them being affected by the light at all. But just to make sure that the water is blocked off for now so that we can finish that up later we're going to put a sign there and then we're going to start fortuning all of the ice on the way down and the fortune doesn't do anything it just means we're not picking up the ice with silk touch and we can make a column of water all the way to the base here. And now that becomes a bubble column that lifts all of the zombies to the top where we're going to make sure this area is blocked off so they can't escape and will be directed by the water streams back down into the center of the farm. Now we've got the tinted glass in here it also allows us to see when the zombie spawner is active and when it is not so we can choose our AFK point for this mechanism because yes this is hopefully going to be an AFKable farm once we're done here. The next step is going to be to rebuild the stone generator over here. So I've made an infinite water source on this side so that we can grab a couple of buckets and start to waterlog some stairs again. This time though we're going to build the platform a little bit differently because we know that each zombie is probably going to drop around 5 XP which means it can generate 5 skulk blocks each time and I actually want to try and balance this platform so that it's only 5 blocks wide and each zombie can in theory create a strip of skulk blocks along the center. So as before our stone blocks are going to be pulled down from the stone generator above of them just to make sure that that can continue to generate stone from a pretty reliable set of waterlogged stairs. We're going to have these pistons push the stone blocks out across the room and a skulk catalyst is going to be converting the stone blocks into skulk when a zombie falls and dies in this area. We're actually only going to stand over here to harvest the skulks so it's not going to have to go up the wall this time. It's not really going to have to travel all that far because we can stand within the range of this zombie spawner and the other advantage of this being five blocks wide is that the player can actually mine five blocks in a row from a standing position without having to move around at all. So if we mine five blocks standing right up against the skulk like this, we can't mine any further than that. But that allows us to collect this automatically if we AFK at this point, just holding down left click on a hoe. Once again, our stone blocks are going to be along here. We're going to have a row of waterlogged stairs in front of those. We're going to use the remainder of the stairs to pillar up on the sides because stairs won't grow skulk on any of the faces which aren't solid meaning that this can only grow skulk on the outside and it's not going to impede the lava as it flows back towards here. One of the problems I noticed with the previous farm when I was designing it was that some of the stair blocks if they were turned inwards like this could grow skulk vein on this face and that would actually stop the liquids from flowing back in towards them. It would stop the water or the lava from flowing back in that direction and it wouldn't generate a stone block the way this farm normally does. But now we can waterlog each of these stair blocks, place a bunch more inward facing stairs stairs like so and a single lava source right here and that's going to convert all of the flowing water below into natural stone. Now we can put in a row of target blocks underneath the sticky pistons, a row of crafted blocks along the back here like polished deep slate just so this row won't be converted into skulk blocks at any point point. and the first thing I'm going to do is put down some redstone dust along those and activate them once just so these pistons will push the stone blocks out of the way and they don't risk destroying the lava source if we push them upwards. I'm also going to do my best to remove any other skulk convertible blocks from the area so all of this natural natural deep slate on either side is going to have to go. Wiring up the other set of sticky pistons, I've got a repeater in here. I'm going to quickly test the delay on that by removing the lava source from up here so we don't end up destroying it. But there's still a row of stone in here. Now let's limit the delay to just one extra tick. So two tick delay on that. Yeah, okay, that works. That works. And then the lava should just convert the rest of that into stone again. Perfect. Just like last time, the input here is going to be an observer. It's not necessarily going to run on the hopper clock this time, though, and we'll get to that in just a second. First, we're going to generate a few more layers of stone, like so. And I think somewhere level with this wall is where we're going to be gathering a bunch of the blocks. So we need to put some hoppers down here for collection. Those can lead to a double chest here, where the player is going to stand collecting all of the skulk with a silk touch hoe. Each time the skulk gets to here, the player is just going to be able to harvest it pretty much immediately he can insta mine skulk with a hoe it's not a big deal but any nearby blocks that we want to avoid having skulk vein growing on them even if they are not convertible into skulk the skulk vein can still spread to them we're gonna have to place buttons on them like so and yes that means putting buttons on basically every available face since skulk can even grow on the underside of blocks we can also put slabs on the underside of the platform the skulk is going to be spreading to and that should hopefully limit the amount it can spread underneath we're also going to try and place buttons on every single block of the redstone 
machinery here as well. Obviously, they will pop off the pistons, so we can't place them there, and we will find that Skulk occasionally grows on these pistons. But it's just going to be the Skulk vein, not the Skulk blocks, so that should be perfectly fine. Now, we are once again going to grab a Skulk catalyst. We're going to put it roughly in the center of this platform, maybe a little bit further back, so that hopefully we can generate some Skulk blocks closer to here. But as long as it's within a four block radius of the areas the zombies are going to die, then it should be able to spread to that area quite easily. The water stream I created earlier terminated just above this, but that's right on the edge of the platform here. So we're going to reorient that so it is a couple of blocks further over and a couple of blocks further in. So the zombies are going to be landing around here, which incidentally measured out perfectly for a single water stream. I love it when that happens. Anyway, we're going to put a sign as far down as we possibly can, about there looks about right, and we're going to have a lava source in there that the zombies are going to have no choice but to fall through. Maybe we'll actually put that a couple of blocks further down if we can, because while the lava will slow their fall slightly, we want to make sure they're taking a decent amount of fall damage, but we also want to make sure they have enough momentum to go through the lava and not just sit on the top of it burning slowly. And with that all sealed off, we should be able to dig down into here and we'll land on the platform directly next to our Skulk Catalyst. Now let's see what happens when we switch the farm on. It's not going to produce any more stone just yet because we haven't set up the mechanism by which it will do that, but at least we can see that the zombie is going to make its way around this system. I'll probably switch the lamp back on and sooner or later the zombie should fall through here on fire, take damage and die on the stone right here. There we go, and that spreads the Skulk and Skulk vein. Obviously, the Skulk is not always going to spread in straight lines, but it is going to search around on this area for blocks it can convert, and most of the time, it's going to find a little bit more stone. Before we go any further, we're going to coat the remainder of this spawner in tinted glass, just to make sure that no light from outside is going to interfere with the spawner spinning up and spawning mobs. And while we're at it, we're going to reattach this redstone line so that we can activate it from closer to where we're going to be collecting the skulk from the farm. In the meantime, the farm has had a lot of zombies drop into it. It's even converted the stone blocks that were ready and waiting in the lava chamber there into skulk, but it doesn't seem to have spread any further than that, which kind of indicates that we've done all of the skulk proofing we need to in this area, at least for now. And maybe we'll add a few more buttons to this top row of stairs and do a quick double check around here to make sure that this stuff doesn't spread any further. We also do not need to worry about any shriekers or sensors produced by this farm. In fact, they're an extra bonus. And so what we could do at this point is rig up our old favorite, the Etho Hopper Clock, to this piston setup to make sure that whenever we were running the farm, this would provide a constant supply of stone, which would hopefully be converted into skulk during the process of the zombies falling down. So we're going to do that to start off with. We're going to throw a stack of Silk Touch Deep Slate into our hopper clock, and now every time that piston moves, this should push out one more row of stone. We can watch the zombies flowing into the farm. They should drop in from the top and produce more skulk every time this farm churns out another row of stone. Meanwhile, we're standing down the other end of the farm, holding down the left click button, netherite hoe in hand, and every time another row of stone gets produced, we harvest another row of skulk from the opposite end. At this point, there are more zombies dying than there are stone blocks being produced, which means we can probably turn the hopper clock down a touch. We can probably take out, let's say, 20 blocks or so out of this machine, and we should hopefully find that this generates stone at a rate commensurate with the amount of skulk we're producing. But of course, that relies on the spawner to churn out enough zombies on a regular enough basis, which in theory it should, but there's a little bit of variation in there. You might want to fine-tune the timing on your hopper clock a little bit. All in all, though, it doesn't seem to be a bad system, and I haven't yet seen a zombie fall down here with armor that hasn't been immediately killed on impact, which means the system should hopefully have enough to deal with any type of armored zombie. And so far, it doesn't look like the skulk has spread anywhere it shouldn't have, so that's good. But we're going to attach a lever to this block and disable the hopper clock for a second because I want to try out another way of letting this farm know when it's ready to produce more stone. And that is by having it listen out for the sounds of the zombies themselves dying. And amazingly enough, this farm actually produces the components that we need to test that out we're going to use skulk sensors to do it. So for this next trick, I need to return to the ancient city because I have a feeling there is a lectern somewhere around here. Yeah, but at the very least, there is one down here in the redstone lab underneath the central portal, which I am going to take along with the comparator. <laughs> oh, alternatively, we could do this using an item frame, which I might actually do. So uh, hold that thought. I'll explain why the lectern would be useful in a second. And it is this point at which I need to give credit where it is due because a member of my community let me know something about skulk sensors that I was having a little bit of trouble with and they said this guy Todd 13 plays has a really good explanation of how to filter frequencies you get by attaching a comparator to a skulk sensor so that only one type of 
action. One type of movement or one type of vibration can be detected and output a redstone signal. So I'm going to link Todd 13 Plays' video in the description. I want you folks to go over and at least say thank you for introducing me to this concept because I think this is a fantastic thing that more people should be trying once you get your hands on these skulk sensors anyway. So with the setup Todd has in his video, you're naturally going to be measuring what vibrations a comparator can detect from a skulk sensor and depending on what the movement is, it's no longer going to be affected by how close you are to the skulk sensor, the comparator is going to be detecting what kind of vibration the skulk sensor is hearing and outputting a different redstone signal depending on what that vibration is. So let's say for example that we want this to detect when we are eating food, but we don't want it to detect our footsteps as we're walking around this thing. Yes, you can occlude skulk sensors with wool, but that blocks vibrations from a certain angle. It doesn't block specific types of vibrations from whatever angle the skulk sensor can detect from. So what we're going to do instead is put a side input comparator here so that we have a signal to measure against the output signal from the skulk sensor. We're going to put this comparator into subtract mode and over here we're going to put a block with an item frame on it so that we can control what this comparator is outputting. We're going to put an arrow in there and we should be able to dial this up so it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If the arrow is pointing straight upwards, this comparator is outputting a signal strength of 7, which means that this comparator is only going to react when there is a signal strength of 8 or more, which as you can now see is not outputting a redstone signal when I'm just walking around here because a player's footsteps register really low on that scale. I think it's only a 1 or 2 redstone output from a comparator, so this comparator is not allowing itself to output a redstone signal because this comparator here is already outputting a more powerful one into the side and this is in subtract mode. But that only imposes a lower limit on this. If we want to block things like a block being placed from being detected by the skulk sensor, a block being placed or broken is going to have a powerful enough redstone signal to be detected here. We need to have something on the other end measuring this and preventing the redstone output from going any further. One of the other things comparators do is output exactly the same signal that they receive on this end. And so if this outputs a high enough redstone signal, we can loop it back around into a repeater and if we take the output output from this redstone signal using a repeater here, it will actually lock the repeater on this side when it receives a redstone signal that is too high because it's able to go back around this circuit, loop back in and activate this repeater. And if we put an extra tick of delay onto this repeater, the repeater from the side is going to lock it before it has a chance to output a redstone signal. And we're going to be doing that into a monostable circuit, which is a pretty old redstone contraption. It's actually something that we used to use before observers were implemented to get a single redstone pulse out of a circuit. Circuit. We're going to place this piece of gravel on top of here and the piston down here is still going to be activated by the redstone signal traveling through this repeater. It's going to be activated by quasi-connectivity or it's effectively going to be powered through this block on attached to the piston head. So now since I have this side input comparator set to a power level of 7, this comparator is only going to activate once it receives a power level of 8 or higher. But if it receives a power level higher than 8, the signal is going to wrap back around into this repeater and that repeater is going to prevent any redstone signal from leaving the circuit and activating the thing it's meant to activate. Obviously the skulk sensor needs to not be detecting any other kind of sound as well, so it's not going to do anything whilst I'm walking around here, and luckily our plan is to stand pretty still next to this thing. We can even occlude it using wool if we wanted to, because you can put a block of wool in between the skulk sensor and the comparator and still have the comparator read something. But anyway, let's say for example if we're standing perfectly still we place a block here. There you go, you'll notice that that repeater gets locked before it ever ends up getting power. Whereas if I take a little bit of damage by throwing myself into the wall using my elytra a couple of times, and I stand near this circuit and I eat a pork chop... Ah, I think our item frame over here is actually outputting a signal of 8, so that needs to be facing the top left corner like that. Yeah, I was forgetting that the item in an item frame counts as one redstone power from a comparator by default. Okay, so let's try that again. Now when I eat a pork chop... 
There we go, it activates the circuit. That piston gets pushed out for one second, and what that would do is actually light up some redstone dust on the opposite side for the fraction of a second it would take the redstone signal to travel through this piece of gravel before the piston pushes it upwards. That effectively outputs the same pulse length as a single pulse from an observer, making this a very useful circuit because a lot of stuff will pulse an observer twice, like a redstone lamp or a note block will send a block update to an observer twice, once when it turns on and once when it turns off. So now this circuit can detect when I eat something and will react accordingly, but it won't do anything when I do something else, and something even louder than the eating sound is as far as the skulk sensor is concerned. And interestingly enough, a mob dying near a skulk sensor actually produces the same amount of redstone signal when it's detected through a comparator as eating does. The same frequency is also created when a projectile lands nearby, but not, interestingly enough, when a projectile is fired nearby. But each of these different vibrations is different enough from each other that we can pretty much make sure we aren't doing one of those actions whilst we're nearby the farm. Like, how often is a mob going to be dying here and we're also going to be firing a bow over here? I will admit eating is a pretty big one, but in this case we're just going to be mining every so often. It wouldn't matter if we ate a pork chop every so often while we are around this farm. And so what we're going to do is set up a skulk sensor underneath the center of the farm which is going to detect when the mobs fall down here and die, and each time it does that it's going to tell the system to push out another row of stone. So first of all we're going to carve away some of the slabs from underneath here because that will create enough space for us to build this redstone circuit. Placing a skulk sensor right here should be close enough to the area that each of these mobs is going to fall down. If we want to block all of the other sounds that are made around this skulk sensor we could of course place some wool on all four sides of it making sure that it only heard the impact of the zombies falling from above but we actually don't need to worry too much about that. Even if it hears these pistons firing that's just going to lock the circuit and prevent them from firing a second time. So we're going to take our comparator output from this skulk sensor directly. We're going to have a second comparator going into the side there, and on the opposite side of this block here is where we want to place our item frame, once again making sure the arrow points to the top left corner so this comparator is outputting a signal strength of 7. We can switch this comparator into subtract mode, and now whilst we're walking around here we shouldn't end up activating this circuit all that often. Placing blocks will activate it a couple of times, but once again we are going to make sure that we have a comparator on the opposite side reading that, wrapping the signal back around into another repeater right here and this repeater is the one that's going to be outputting any kind of signal. To pass that signal through we're going to have a piston with a gravel block on top of it here and I need to make sure that gravel isn't converted by skulk. Because if it is we might have to swap this out for concrete powder or we might have to move the circuit a block or two away from the farm to make sure it's not right here next to where all the zombies are going to go. This doesn't have to be a sticky piston by the way but making it a sticky piston allows you to use blocks for the monostable circuit which aren't gravity assisted blocks stuff like skulk for example if we wanted to use it but you can make a monostable circuit without using a sticky piston if you put a regular piston and a block that's affected by gravity. Now we're going to channel the output from this circuit over here into this redstone dust which should activate the circuit in the same way that our hopper clock did. And to see if it works all I have to do is get hungry again and eat something near the machine because when I eat this pork chop the circuit should activate it'll pulse the circuit once and I don't think that activated that row of pistons so I think the signal may be having a hard time trying traveling down from here with how short the pulse length is, which is why it's a good idea to have a repeater handy on the other side of your monostable circuit, to extend the pulse length by just enough that it's going to have an easier time traveling down diagonal blocks like this. Now let's try eating one more time, and in this case, yes, there we go, it's worked. <laughs> the stone was generated just fine, and that should now happen anytime a zombie falls down here and the skulk sensor isn't busy detecting some other sound. So we do have two separate mechanisms now powering the same thing. We've got the hopper clock if we want to have a regular supply of stone, and we have this experimental skulk sensor circuit right here. Let's give that a try. Let's go up there, activate the farm, and see how frequently this generates a layer of stone, and if the zombies dying on here can keep up with it. Well, a couple of zombies have fallen down so far, and that's our first time the machine has spat out any stone. I think we might actually have to do a little bit of occlusion here because I think the skulk sensor is picking up when the zombies are swimming upwards in the bubble column. Sometimes, yeah, whenever the zombies hit the ground there, the machine should be spitting out some more stone, and it will do that when the rest of the machine is quiet, when there aren't any other zombies coming through the system like that. But as you can see, whenever there's a zombie in the pipe over there, 
it's having a slightly harder time spitting out the stone because the sensor is already busy detecting a different sound. But on average, every couple of zombies is actually doing what we want it to. Once there's a bit of a break in the spawns from the machine, it's actually ejecting the stone and causing the skulk to be pushed over, which is exactly what we want here. All right, I'm going to turn the machine off. There are two things I have noticed. Oh, yeah, that's a concern. Right, okay, so first of all, <laughs> while it is still operating the machine just fine, this block here has turned to skulk, which does mean that we're going to have to replace that and, of course, the block next to it, which was... Oh, uh, I gosh, I, I used a regular deep slate for that, so we are going to have to replace that block there as well. Because what that's done is allow the skulk to spread to the natural blocks below the farm here, which we could once again cover up with some other kind of block. We could put some slabs down there just to make sure, but we need to make sure these blocks here are super artificial. So we can't use gravel for the monostable circuit. We can't use a regular block of deep slate for this. We're going to have to use something a little bit more refined. But the other thing I'm going to do is move this whole circuit over one, which should mean we don't actually need to worry too much about what that block there is, because I want to make sure we occlude the sound of the zombies in this pipe over here, which means we're probably going to put a wall block on this side and this side, and that should prevent any vibrations from coming through this way diagonally. All right, I've moved the whole thing over. We now have wool in between the skulk sensor and this comparator, and I think that might be okay. The wool block here might prevent the skulk sensor from hearing the zombies in that tube. It's difficult to say, but I have swapped out these two blocks here, so hopefully those should not be converted into skulk now. Let's turn the spawner on one more time and see how we get on here. Yeah, it does look like the sensor is hearing the zombies in the tube, unfortunately, but but hopefully once they make an impact on the ground here, there we go, it's producing blocks and every time it does that, there we go, we get another row of skulk generated. My main hope here is that we keep the skulk catalyst busy enough generating skulk that it's not going to bother generating too much extra fluff like skulk sensors. And the rates at which the zombies are falling down here are frequent enough that we don't end up with any stone blocks like that left over after a couple of zombies have fallen down here. That is the main problem with this. But looking at it, it does look like it's gotten rid of the remaining stone blocks, which means every zombie that comes down here now should be able to generate enough skulk that we can keep holding down left click and farm this continuously. Overall though, I think this is a vast improvement on the previous design. I really think we've started to iron out the kinks with these things, and we also get to use a really neat way of detecting specific frequencies from skulk sensors. So once again, Shout out to Todd13Plays for the brilliant explanation of that. I think that's a video well worth watching if you're interested in getting a little bit more familiar with Skulk Sensors. But for now, I think that's where we're going to wrap up this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Hopefully you folks enjoyed this redesign of the Skulk Farm. I think it's going to work a lot better for our purposes from this point onwards. But that's going to be it from me. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you.